Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining. Uh, my name is Jose Luis Molinuevo. I'm, I'm the scientific director of Barcelona Beta Brain Research Center. I'm a neurologist by training for those who do not know me, and I've been very much involved with EPAD from the from the very beginning uh, because I, I I am collating it together with uh, Craig Rich and Simon Lofson from the academic perspective. So for me, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you. Uh, I will try to be uh, concise, but at the same time informative. So what I'm going to be covering during today is, is the use we are giving right now to Alzheimer's disease CSF biomarkers. I'm going to be to be giving a little bit of a background on, on how things are changing from a, let's say, diagnostic and classification perspective at the very beginning, because that gives additional value of on the biomarkers and how we can use them. So what you're seeing here is are the original uh, prep, are not a pathological preparation that Alzheimer used when, when he diagnosed August D. Uh, and I'm placing them because uh, here are the basic proteins that are core of the AD biomarkers that we are currently using. As you all are well aware, the initial criteria uh, that came out in 1984 was very, very much a clinical pathological criteria, which means that in order to make a definitive AD diagnosis, the person had to be showing uh, from a clinical perspective a dementia clinical picture. And from a pathology perspective, uh, we had to be seeing tangles and plaques. If we were not able to have the pathology with us, which was, as you can imagine, the obvious situation with uh, practicing neurologists and neuropsychiatrists, then the only kind of diagnosis that we were able to make was probably the diagnosis. Over time, we have been realizing that uh, this criteria correlates poorly with pathology. So even if it was being used in clinical trials, uh, the, the criteria was not, let's say, good enough. So at the time, no biomarkers were there and no biomarkers were needed. But things have been changing over time. And uh, as you know, there's been increasing work by the International Working Group uh, in, which, uh, in which we are we developed initially in 2007 some criteria with, for, for the first time was incorporating the biomarkers. That evolved, and in, in, this is coming from the 2014 IWG criteria, where we were, at least at the time, the research diagnostic criteria not only incorporated biomarkers, but mainly or only incorporated those biomarkers that were proxies with pathology. So IW2 criteria 2014 was stating that we need a core clinical criteria and then some key biomarkers, which are either CSF or amyloid or tau pet imaging to make the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. Obviously from our research perspective always. Uh, this evolved over time, and I, you know, I can let you know that next month a new paper will be coming out, which is the 2018 NIAA research framework, uh, which I have had the pleasure to be working at. And in the last two years, we have been having meeted, meetings in order to define and create a new research framework in which the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease is mainly based or it's only based in living people that have those positive biomarkers that are proxies of pathology. So the diagnosis is not longer based anymore on the clinical consequences of the disease. That means that the clinical symptoms being either MCI or dementia can be laid down incorporated in order to stage it, but to define the disease, that definition is mainly based in biomarkers. So this is one of the tables that will be coming out in this paper. And as, as you can see, we are using the ATM profiles. And if you look into the biomarker category with a normal, let's say, negative ATM profile, normally the biomarkers, that's the biomarker category, if we have only amyloid and not tau, which are the second and third row, then we call that Alzheimer's pathologic change because we acknowledge that amyloid is part of the pathology and probably those people are already within the Alzheimer's continuum. That's why on your right, you have the Alzheimer's continuum. But in order to make the 
diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, you need both A positive, tau positive. You know, tau can be either tau pet imaging or P tau in CSF. If amyloid is negative, then we call that a non AD pathologic change. So, with this introduction, what I'm giving value is to the biomarkers. And I think biomarkers now are key in order to define the disease. This is finally fully acknowledged in this uh, research framework paper that will be coming up in a couple of weeks. That's on one side. On the other, we have been using them for decades, showing that really they are clearly, clearly very useful for both diagnosis and also for prognosis. And that's what I'm going to be covering in the next slides. So just before I enter fully into the ADCS the biomarkers, this is a picture that actually showing you how we understand now the, con the continuum. Uh, we understand AD as a biomarker-based diagnostic continuum where you can have people with normal cognition, but if they have already both amyloid and tau biomarkers, those are considered to be in the preclinical stage of the disease. You know, this is key from, from a, let's say, an impact perspective, because that's where we can launch and perform secondary prevention trials. If symptoms become evident, usually memory is the initial one, then you have you enter the mild cognitive impairment, and then you move into dementia. So what kind of use can we give to CSF biomarkers? Well, I, I always distinguish the clinical setting and the research and trial setting. Obviously, uh, most of the things I'm going to be speaking about are more research-based. Uh, as you have seen, the 2018 NIAA are called research framework. That is not to be used in clinical practice right now. But nevertheless, I think that already biomarkers are being used in, in clinical practice. We do use them in people with MCI, for example, uh, and, and they can be used with clear different goals. They can be used for screening, they can be used for diagnostic or prognostic. Uh, if we talk mainly about CSF biomarkers, I would say that mainly they are for diagnostic and prognosis in, the cl in clinical practice. When we move into research, they can be used also for screening, although uh, I would say that it's a very expensive screening. Uh, it's more used for inclusion criteria. They can be used for target engagement, for prognosis, as an outcome measure. I will talk, the end of my talk will be on the use of CSF as an outcome measure or, or which CSF biomarkers really qualify or potentially may qualify as an outcome measure. When we check the requirements for an AD diagnostic biomarkers, it has to be, to be linked to fundamental features of AD neuropathology. It has been, it has to be been validated in neuropathologically confirmed cases. You need different studies to confirm that validation. You have to be able to detect the disease early in its, in its course, which it is obvious if it's linked to fundamental features because the neuropathology obviously comes much earlier than the symptoms. So if those biomarkers are proxies of neuropathology, then they are going to be able to detect the, the disease early in its course. It has to be able to distinguish AD from other conditions. It has to be specific. Ideally, a biomarker should be non-invasive, which is not the case of CSF biomarker, and should not be influenced by symptomatic drug treatment, which is the case of uh, CSF biomarkers. So when we look at CSF A beta fortitude, it has been validated in, neuro, uh, in neuropathology. You can see in the left of, of the screen the correlation between A beta 1 to 42 levels and the neuritic plate count. You can see in vivo a correlation as well, and this will be coming up later on of uh, A beta CSF levels and floor beta peer, which as you know is one of the PET imaging ligands, and it's a significant uh, correlation as well. It has also been confirmed in validated cases with neuropathology. When, when, when you look at the left of your slide, you can see uh, 
a figure which is capturing the correlation. Uh, well, it's, it's not a correlation, sorry, it's an ROC curve. So you are seeing the sensitivity and specificity of ADCSF biomarkers to capture uh, neuropathology. And that was further confirmed in ADNI cases. This is a paper published by Les Shaw uh, already like seven, eight years ago. So as you can see, uh, sorry, I go back, uh, ADCSF biomarkers are, are linked to fundamental features of pathology and they have been already validated in neuropathologically confirmed cases. I'm going to move now in how we are validating or how we have validated the platform that is going to be using IPAD, because I think this is uh, important for all of you to know. So uh, those that of you that are following, uh, you know, the IPAD biomarker uh, group, we, as you know, we have decided to use Alexis, which is the ROG diagnostic system in order to perform the CSF analysis. So how were the cutoff of Alexis validated. The cutoff of, Lex, of the Alexis system were validated with uh, three different parts. The first part was to determine the cutoff. The second was to adjust different pre-analytical conditions in order to cross-validate that cutoff with a completely different sample. Uh, why do we need part two? Is all of you that have been working with CSF biomarkers, you know that pre-analytical conditions and how we handle the samples and the tubes we use are key in order to determine the final cutoff. So since the original cutoff was determined in the BioFinder study and the second was going to be validated, not the second, sorry, and this was going to be further validated in the ANNI sample since the pre-analytical conditions were different, we needed a part two, which is in the middle, to check how samples perform and which values do they give when you use the pre-analytical system of the BioFinder or the pre-analytical system of the ADNI. And that gave a coefficient of change between using one pre-analytical system or the other, and that was applied on the initial cutoff in order to determine the cutoff for ADNI and check again his ROC uh, characteristics. So the initial cutoff was determined in the BioFinder uh, you know the BioFinder is study led by Oscar Hanson in Sweden. Uh, they have participants with both subjective cognitive decline, MCI, and dementia, and normal cognitive people as well. So what they use as gold standard was amyloid PET imaging. And this is something which is extremely important. The, the field has swift and has changed for validating a cutoff on, let's say, case control designs towards a validated a cutoff against either pathology or another biomarker, which is also a proxy of pathology. I, I think, I mean, if you're working in the field, this is very obvious. If you're not, this is uh, a very important thing because if you check the literature and, and you check for the AUC on, on the initial studies using CSF biomarkers, it seemed that the sensitivity and the specificity wasn't great. But the reason why is because they were comparing cases and controls. And as you know, there are many cases up to 30% that they don't have AD pathology. And there are many controls after 70 years old, again, around 30% that even if they are, let's say, controls, normal cognition, they harbor AD pathology. Those are the preclinical cases. So that's why sensitivity and specificity wasn't that great. So the field moved and realized that these are biomarkers of pathology. So if you want to test the accuracy of these biomarkers, then you have to test it either against pathology or against another biomarker that is been shown to be a clear uh, marker and proxy of pathology. And this is what it was done here. In the part, in the first part, 277 participants with amyloid PET imagings available were used in order to define the optimal cutoff for uh, CSF analysis. So actually what we are determining is the cutoff for defining amyloid positivity. And this is completely independent of the clinical stage. There are people with SCD or people with MCI. But since the gold standard is 
uh, fluid methanol imaging, it doesn't matter that much the clinical stage, which is the again the whole philosophy of the new research framework. So part two, it was calculated the coefficient of variability on the values after being tested with Alexis, depending in the pre-analytical condition, and then it was cross-validated with a new sample which was coming from Andy. So in this slide, what you are seeing is the huge difference between you know PET positive, PET negative. You can see in the left figure on your left the values of A beta 42. And as you can see, the optimal cutoff was given a 92% sensitivity, which was 1,100 picograms per mil. Again, those of you who have been using uh, CSF markers for a long time and were used to uh, the ELISA values, this doubled the original values that we were using to determine, uh, let's say, the, to determine the presence of Alzheimer's disease 10 years ago. So the cutoff has clearly increased, but when we check for the sensitivity and specificity, as you can see, it's quite good. Uh, when we use ratios, this is clearly improved. And, and this is, there is the reason behind is that we are using amyloid imaging, but you are, we are using the visual reads, which become positive, as you know, quite late compared with some SUVR readings that we could be uh, using. And that's why the ratio performs much better than A beta 42 by itself. Important part is when we check these, these ratios and, and these cutoffs in the ADNI cohort, you can see, again, sensitivity is quite good. We are talking about 85% uh, of sensitivity and specificity with a, a very good uh, area under the curve. Uh, and when we use the ratio, that clearly improves again. So with this, uh, I think we are all quite comfortable of using both the Alexis system for CSF analysis and using the proper cutoff to determine amyloid positivity. Again, we have to remember that these cutoffs are correlating with the visual read. If we want to go even earlier in the disease course, we may be able in the future, and this can be future IPAD work, we can be determining other cutoffs that correlate with earlier stages of amyloid deposition, like for example, the entering the gray zone of amyloid deposition. Those cutoffs will be different. So, as the end of the, this first part, uh, the cutoff for, for PET concordance has been determined and validated between two independent clinical cohorts for A beta 42, T tau, and P tau. This is very important. I mean, the fully automatized system are a unique opportunity that we have right now because it doesn't matter where you test the sample, the values that is going to give you is going to be very similar, and that has been shown already by Kai, Kai Bleno in the QC program. So now the pre-analytical conditions become key elements because if there is variability, it's going to be determining, it's going to be determined by the pre-analytical conditions rather than by the analytical ones. So the Lexi CSF biomarkers A beta 42, the ratios uh, are concordant to amyloid PET imaging. And I think, as I said, this is uh, a huge starting point for for EPAD as well. So when we go to the general concept of the biomarkers, the other thing that has been shown is that, again, the ratios behave optimally to distinguish AD from other dementias. And this was performed in the Okima cohort. This is a paper published uh, three years ago. So, yeah. So I think that, you know, we can reliably say that ADCSF biomarkers are very clear-cut, properly defined biomarkers to diagnose AD. And again, we are determining and we are, let's say, identifying AD from a pathological perspective. This is a biomarker-based diagnose, but they have been linked to pathology, confirmed, validated in different studies. They obviously can detect very early the disease in its course because we can determine AD in the preclinical stage and these biomarkers can distinguish AD from other conditions. What about if we want to use ADCSF biomarkers as prognostic markers? 
So what are we asking? Uh, what characteristic are we asking for a marker to become prognostic? Well, obviously, it has to have prognostic value. That means that when you have a high levels of high levels of the biomarkers baseline, that is going to be predicting the outcome in the future. They don't have to be linked to pathology in this case, because we don't want to identify the disease. We want to make a prognosis of the disease. So not necessarily linked. It doesn't have to be specific. We may have prognostic markers that may work in different diseases. And, and this is a very important thing. I mean, it's not necessarily the case in AD because the biomarkers we are using for identifying some of them are prognostic, uh, but there are new markers that I will be talking later on. Some of them are not specific, but they can be prognostic. And ideally, again, non-invasive, non-invasive, and not influenced by symptomatic drug treatment. So this is a paper that was published a few years ago, almost five years ago. This is coming from Washington University in St. Louis, and this is performing normal cognitive people. And you can see by the survival curves that uh, those people that have positive biomarkers, which you have in, in the, with the red uh, line, they were very likely to progress in the upcoming years. And you have you can clearly see it in your uh, figure on your right. We perform a very similar study in, in, a, in our clinical uh, research unit. And as you can see, those people with pathological A beta fortitude to beta ratio, in five years time, most of them had progressed to AD dementia. And this was performed in the clinic with patients with subjective cognitive decline and mild cognitive impairment. So very early in the disease continuum, if you have positive biomarkers, obviously they are going to be predictive, which is not a surprise because what we are identifying here is in those people with those symptoms through the biomarkers, we are identifying those who have the pathology of Alzheimer's disease so therefore, those are going to progress because they have the disease. If the biomarkers are normal, they are much more unlikely to progress. If they progress, it's because they have other pathologies, but most of them uh, are dementia-free at five years' time. In fact, only 15% of, 15 of the ones that uh, were uh, positive were dementia-free at five years, and very few of them with normal progress, around 10% progress uh, in five years, obviously due to other conditions. So ADCSF biomarkers, the traditional one, meaning A beta 42, P tau and total tau are very good uh, diagnostic or uh, let's say markers that are able to identify the pathology of the disease and therefore are very good prognostic markers at the same time. What about disease progression? What about uh, trying to define a biomarker to measure disease progression? Well, they have to be linked to fundamental features of the pathophysiology, not necessarily the pathology, but of the pathophysiology. They have to be able to measure disease progression. They have to be specific for the feature that we are measuring. Not necessarily this is specific. And ideally, they have to be suitable for trials and ideally non-invasive. Uh, you will see in the next slide that you know a biomarker that is able to measure neurodegeneration not necessarily is a good biomarker for disease progression. <clears throat> so if we ask the question that you know, traditional ADCSF biomarkers do measure neurodegeneration, the answer is yes. Uh, there are many studies showing a very good correlation of both CSF tau and P tau with cognition, MRI measures, FDG PET. So they are measuring neurodegeneration. But uh, as I was saying a moment ago, one thing is measuring neurodegeneration cross sectionally, and another is to measure the changes of neurodegeneration over time. That's a completely different business. And that's becoming, uh, let's say, an outcome measure of a trial or potentially a surrogate marker. Uh, what I can tell you, and you are going to be seeing in the next slide, 
is that the traditional AD biomarkers are not there. This is a study performed by, by VUMC many years ago. Uh, and when they check on the longitudinal changes, and you can see it in your table on your right, when you take the, let's say, the MCA stable and the MCA progressive, there are differences at baseline. That's obvious. Uh, because those stable do not harbor the pathology, those progressive do harbor the pathology, so you can see that there are differences. But when you look at the follow-up, the differences between the baseline and the follow-up in both groups is small, and the standard deviation is huge. So, I mean, the amount, and this is happening also with tau and p-tau. I mean, if you look at p-tau, baseline, 83, uh, follow-up 85. There's almost no change with a huge standard deviation. So they measure neurodegeneration at baseline, both tau and p-tau, but they are not able to capture a change in neurodegeneration. Why is that? Uh, well, we have been having long conversations trying to understand this uh, between the people that work in the biomarker field. We do think that one of the potential reasons is that you enter a state of dynamic equilibrium in the CSF. So at the very beginning, there is a clear increase in tau and p tau, but that enters a state of equilibrium where even if there are still an increase, that degree of increment is not high enough to change the value in the CSF. There are recent papers coming from Washington University in St. Louis showing actually that some of them may be decreasing over time. So clearly, uh, even if they are very good on capturing neurodegeneration, they are not that good to measure neurodegeneration over time. And I, you know, the upcoming slides are a little bit more of the same thing because they are clearly showing the same thing in different cohorts. And if we take any biomarker, uh, PTAU, uh, we can see the baseline values and the follow-up values, and they change, but again, the degree of change, the standard deviation is always higher sometimes than the degree of change. If you take the MCI group, for example, baseline for p is 534. When you go follow up, it's 563, but the standard deviation is 478. So clearly, they're not able to measure changes over time. This is a little bit of the same. This is a clear graph, so what I just said, I mean, in, in let's say, white, you have the baseline shadow, you have the follow-up, and you can see that, you know, cross-sectionally there are differences, obviously, between uh, the groups, especially this MCI that are due to AD are very different to the normal controls and the MCI group that remains MCI, does not progress, but that follow-up, there's not much change. So, again, they are exactly showing the same kind of things in this with T tau, you can see follow up, the mean value is even smaller. This is one of the studies showing what I just said before, that there are studies showing that over time, maybe P tau and total tau value may decrease instead of keep on increasing. While, as we know, in the continuum of the disease, neurodegeneration keeps on increasing. So I'm going to give you a little bit of an idea of new markers that are coming up. And then I'm going to be finishing with one of the markers that is, I, I would say, it's probably the most promising marker to measure uh, change over time in our field. So of, I, I have selected a few because uh, obviously uh, I could have been talking about many biomarkers, but I'm basically going to be talking about neurogranin, NFL, neurofilament light, and, and Philip one. So uh, neurogranin, as you know, is a it's a marker of the synapses. It's expressed in the dendritic spines. So we know it's involved in postsynaptic signaling pathways. And we know it's important for synaptic plasticity and long-term potentiation. We know that the levels may be reflecting synaptic degeneration and they do correlate and there are studies showing that they correlate with memory and the rate of cognitive decline. So in this slide, as you can see, is the, let's say, the capacity of neurogranin as a diagnostic marker by itself. You, you are seeing here stable 
MCI that are amyloid negative, stable MCI that are amyloid positive, and you can see a difference. And obviously, progressive MCI that are amyloid positive, you can be seeing a difference both with those that are progressive but amyloid negative, and between, I mean, progressing, amyloid positive but stable, and progressive as well. But what is key in this slide is those that are amyloid positive that are reflected with a plus, independent of the cognitive stage, cognitively normal, stable MCI, progressive MCI, or already Alzheimer's disease dementia, there are significant differences with the groups that are amyloid negative. So it seems to be a marker that correlates somehow with the fact of being amyloid positive. But as you can see, you are, we are seeing here again, a mean decrease in those that are in the, in the dementia stage. So higher CSM neogranin in amyloid positive in both stable and MCI cases. And when we check if it's specific for AD, as you can see in this slide, this is sporadic Alzheimer's disease, this familial Alzheimer's disease in which you get the biggest levels. This is the semantic variant of FTD is slightly increased levels as well, but it seems to be very much related with Alzheimer's disease. So I would say neogranin is quite specific, or at least right now with the amount of studies that we have, we are seeing increases mainly in the Alzheimer's disease continuum, as shown in the previous slide and this slide. If we ask the question if neogranin is a good prognostic marker, uh, what you are seeing in these slides, are the changes in minimental over time, in hypocampal volume over time, and in FDG PET over time. And those that had the higher values of neurogranin, quartile third or fourth, are those that are declining the most over time. So higher values at the very beginning are predictive of cognitive, hypocampal volume chain, and FDG change as, as well over time. So it's a good prognostic marker as well. Let's go to VILIP1. VILIP1 is a neuronal calcium sensor protein, influence intracellular neuronal signaling uh, that are also involved in synaptic plasticity. It has been considered to be a marker of neuronal injury. And let's see what the data shows. Again, when you check and look the values of a CSF VILIP1 comparing AD, MCI, and controls, you can see increasing values over time being the highest in Alzheimer's disease. When you compare with other pathologies like Lewy body disease, you can see again quite uh, higher and significant different values. Again, it's a very good prognostic uh, marker, like, like it was shown with uh, neurobranin. You can see that the highest values here are predicted of a change of both CDR sum of boxes, a global composite, or an episodic memory composite. So here you have in, in, in black those with uh, higher values. Sorry, because it's not uh, very clear, but uh, that this is what it's showing. The black line is the upper tertile, so the black line is predictive over time of changes in all the different cognitive uh, domains. So again, we have both neurogranin and, and VILIP1 to have shown to be quite good uh, diagnostic and prognostic uh, markers as well. If the value is better than the ones that we usually uh, use, I don't think that has been properly set. But nevertheless, the, let's say the traditional ID biomarkers are very much base their value not only in the uh, in the ROC curves that they have shown, but in the fact, as we were seeing at the very beginning, that they are proxies of pathology. And that's that's that is very important. I'm going to move a little bit into uh, YKL40 and TREM2. Uh, YKL40 is a marker of astrogliosis. STREM2 is a marker of microgliosis. Uh, and um, I'm going to be showing some of the studies that we have been performing at BPRC using these two markers. We, in, uh, years ago, uh, we saw that uh, there were 
statistical differences in YKL40 both in the prodromal stage of the disease, this was already much higher than the one that we were seeing also in dementia due to AD, which is not shown in this slide, but also in obviously normal controls and preclinical. Interested when you when we look at the preclinical AD group, we could see that there was clearly already an increase in the levels of YKL40, but there was a huge spread, which was something that, you know, for us it seemed very interesting because uh, we interpret this like there are some preclinical AD mark, uh, participants that already have extremely high YKL40 levels, uh, meaning astrogliosis is extremely active, and those may be slightly different from those that have completely normal YKL40 values. So we performed several imaging studies and um, we saw that over time YKL40 changes along the continuum and the most interesting thing is that we observe the anatomical correlates and as you can see in the left of, of the slide, oh, sorry, on your right, uh, on blue you have those structural changes that are related with, with P-tau basically, with neurodegeneration and in red you have the changes that are related with YKL40. So as you can see, YKL40 is impacting areas that are nearby neurodegeneration. This is a cross-sectional study. Uh, we hypothesize that the areas affected by YKL40 probably uh, are suffering inflammatory uh, consequences of the disease, and then they may be undergoing later neurodegeneration over time. This is to be uh, shown and proven in longitudinal studies. We check for uh, estrogen correlates and we kind of saw the same thing. There are areas of the brain where estrogen is creating a structural change, while there are others where are more related with, with P-tau and there are some of them in yellow where we are, having, we are seeing changes of estrogen and P-tau at the same time. We have right now, and these are the mean deficit changes related with, with a stream. And the interesting part here is that those areas that show a change in cortical thickness, sometimes was an increase in cortical thickness, and they were showing changes in diffusivity at the same time, in the same areas you can see, indicating that probably that increase in cortical thickness is due to the microgliosis being there and restricting the diffusion of water molecules. Uh, we have right now uh, submitted a paper showing the longitudinal changes related with STREM and YKL40 levels in preclinical Alzheimer's disease. What I can tell you is that those people with higher STREM levels seem to be somehow protective and they experience less structural changes than those that have low estrogen levels, and the opposite is happening with YKL40. So it seems, as was initially hypothesized by Christian Haas, that estrogen may be protective somehow, while uh, the astrogliosis linked with high YKL40 levels may be deleterious. And just to finish up, I'm going to speak briefly on NFL. NFL uh, stands for neurofilament light. It's a component of the neurofilament, which are part of the cytoskeleton. Uh, and since we are heading towards the end and I want to have some time for discussion, I'm going to so be showing you the data. When we check, this was published already in 2015, the levels of NFL in different disease condition, you can see that it does increase in all of them. So clearly it's a marker that is related with, let's say, neurodegeneration or ne neurodegenerative conditions, but it is not specific for Alzheimer's disease because you can say this is early Alzheimer's disease, this is late Alzheimer's disease, but it is increased in many, especially in FTD. When you look, uh, NFL is, a, again, a very good prognostic marker. The interesting thing, which I think it's, the, yeah, this is the next slide. The first, this is the first study that saw that 
NFL can be used potentially in clinical trials. This was a trial of, of multiple sclerosis, but those people that were treated with, with uh, natalizumab, they show an improvement, a clinical improvement, and that also was related with a decrease in the NFL levels that were very similar at the end of the trial to that observed in healthy controls. This was the pre-treatment levels, as you can see, extremely high. They received treatment, and after treatment in a double-blind uh, clinical trial, you can see th that the levels came down to, let's say, normal levels. So this is not Alzheimer's disease, it's a completely different condition, but again, this is promising because maybe NFL is one of the markers to be used as a, let's say, uh, let's use the word surrogate marker for a moment, uh, of it could be a marker of disease progression and a measure outcome in one potentially clinical trial. Uh, there, from these, there are new studies that have come out showing the usefulness of NFL not only in CSF but in blood to pick up neurodegeneration in many other different conditions, including autosomal dominant AD. So this is my last slide. Uh, I think, uh, hopefully I have convinced you that current established uh, ADC, CSF biomarkers are good diagnostic and prognostic markers. I'm talking here about the classic uh, triad A beta 42, P tau, and T tau. I would include the A beta 40. I don't think I have the time to talk about A beta 40 and the uh, 40 to 42 ratio, the 42 to 40 ratio, which is extremely uh, useful to pick up also amyloid deposition. Upcoming CSF markers like Neurogranny, and Philip 1, and FL will also contribute for the diagnosis and prognostic. I think potentially NFL could be an outcome measure of disease progression and neurodegeneration that could be applied in, in trials. Uh, and there are other markers. I, I just gave you a flavor of what we are been, have been doing with uh, YKL40 and SRAM applied to Alzheimer's disease. There are many other markers there. They measure specific uh, pathophysiological aspects of the disease, I think that can be extremely useful to explore other pathways that are related with the physiopathology, uh, but I don't think they have a role as a diagnostic, prognostic, or outcome measure. And I think with this, uh, I finish. Thank you all. Bye.